Okay, so um, I'd like to just jump right in. You've got my bio. There, I don't really want to spend time telling you what I've done. It's not necessary, so let's just jump right in. I'm, a, I'm somebody who does a lot of screening research. And oftentimes when you're doing screening research, you can talk about analogies to medicine. And it, and it resonates with people because we all consume health care. And it's easy for us to think about um, how that works in our lives because we've all experienced it with our children, with our parents, with ourselves. Okay, so there is a guy in emergency medicine who writes about patients. And he says that patients are, there are three kinds of patients. There are patients who are doctor proof. There are patients who are doctor indifferent, and there are patients for whom you really might make a difference as, a, as an ER doctor. And what he means by that is that when you're, if you're an ER doctor standing in an ER and somebody rolls in on a gurney, there, it could be that no matter what you do, that patient might die, right? And so you're not really going to make a difference. That would be a, a, a doctor indifferent patient. And then there could be a patient who rolls in who is doctor proof, and what that means is they were going to get better no matter what. It was a false alarm. They weren't really, really, really ever going to die anyway, so it doesn't really matter what you do. They are doctor proof. You almost can't screw it up. And then there are the ones in the middle. There are the ones in the middle. Well, I kind of think about this with us in schools. Um, there are kids for sure who are teacher proof. And those are children often who um, have other benefits in their life. Like oftentimes, th those are not going to be children who receive free and reduced lunch. They might have other social supports that enrich their lives. They come into school reading. They come into school with basic math skills already intact. And so we call these children, I would call these children, teacher, teacher proof. They're going to do fine almost no matter what antibiotic you give them, right? then I really don't believe there are teacher indifferent kids. They do not exist. Everybody can grow. Everybody can grow from day to day. So the rest of the kids who are not teacher proof are kids for whom it really matters what you do. If you don't bring the most precise, most efficient, most high return on investment tactic to bear upon the learning of that child, their trajectory is going to be terrible. Can I tell you something? In my world, we are so great about making predictions. Um, we, we've never been terrible about making predictions in the world of school psychology. We know we can forecast how children are going to do based upon some, some simple scores that we can get. And we can forecast really accurately. But what happens is a lot of times, even at conferences like this, we spend a whole lot of time talking about assessment and assessment and assessment. We've never had trouble predicting what an outcome would be for kids. We've known how to do that for 40 years, maybe more. What we have trouble doing, what we have trouble doing is using the assessment information to make a difference. Not just a prediction, but a difference. And that means we have to get away from the assessment pretty quickly. Get the information that we need to cause us to be able to do something differently so that we can get a better result for kids. Okay, the, there's a guy named Eric Hanyashek, and this is a quote from one of his papers. He is an economist who writes about um, economic theory and education and what it would take to improve the educational um, performance of students in the United States. Now, he does make a really good point with data that highly effective teachers, we know who they are. We can find them in, in the trajectories, the learning trajectories of students. And what he says at the end of some of his papers is what we really should do is get rid of the lowest performing, the least effective 15% of teachers. Now, I mean, I'm with him. I'm like with him all the way to that conclusion. And I go, can you imagine any industry where you came in and got rid of 15% of the people who are employed? <laughs> Hugely destabilizing, right? It wouldn't work. It looks good in an economic analysis. And in fact, he, he takes their data out and he demonstrates that you get this wonderful return in learning. But it just would not work in the real world because it would be totally destabilizing. Teachers would be afraid to try anything. They would be so afraid that if they weren't effective, they would lose their job. So it is a wonderful thing to look at his research and say, we know who effective teachers are, and I want to be one, and I want to figure out how to be one. So here, let me give you some 
information about what it takes to be that highly effective teacher. And then I want to talk about leadership. I want to talk about how, if, how leaders in education can support teachers to attain that high efficacy that we know you're, everybody's capable of. Okay, first of all, there's no effect for special instruction. This is kind of hard for people to hear sometimes. You know, I, I, I've been in this field a long time now, and it amazes me how much we still love to talk about things that don't work. And sometimes when we talk about something that doesn't work and we talk about it for years and years and years, it goes away but it comes back with a new name and we start talking about it again. And I don't understand that because we have really excellent data that show that things like modality matched instruction, which is the aptitude by treatment interactions like visual input for visual learners, helps them get better learning and you get better. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The average effect size is about 0.1 for these, for these tactics. The guy who published that, by the way, was not an RTI guy. He wasn't somebody who promoted RTI. His name was Ken Cavalli. He's not alive anymore. But it's a great paper. It's a seminal paper. And he demonstrated that the tactics that produce the biggest effect are in this category, direct instruction techniques, things that are available to teachers without any complicated psychological assessment. You can, you can use them right away, increase opportunities to respond, increase corrective feedback, um, include motivators for student performance, align the difficulty of the content with what the learner is ready to deliver. These are tactics that are available to you before you look at any complicated batteries of assessment, and those are the ones that give you the greatest effect. So what is effective teaching? What is effective teaching? My favorite quote, pretty much, comes from this guy, Kent Johnson, who you might have heard of. He's written some books, and he's been, uh, he opened a school in about 1981, I think, called Morningside Academy in Seattle. And he runs a teacher institute every summer. He's very well known. He's a, he traces his lineage just about two steps to B.F. Skinner. So um, anyway, Kent Johnson says, teaching is not telling. That is so powerful to me, because just because I have told you does not mean that you have learned it. Teaching, he says, is that you, your behavior grows. If you don't grow, then I did not teach you. There's a guy named Fred Keller, who was a colleague of B.F. Skinner's, and he said, the learner is never wrong. The learner is never wrong. If the learner gets it wrong, then that's a reflection on the way we taught. And we need to make an adjustment to our teaching so we can get a better result from the learner. So teaching is not telling. So what is teaching? Well, first of all, effective teaching controls all the effect and the outcome for kids. And that's important for you to hear because I'm, I'm a researcher and we are always looking for variables that we can put in our analyses to take away some of the variants so we can focus on what we're really trying to study. And I'm here to tell you that the quality of teaching, the quality of what unfolds between the learner and the teacher every single day trumps, oh, that's a bad word to use now. I don't mean it in the way you think, but it, it um, trumps every demographic risk factor that we can look at. Now that's important for you to hear because the job that you do, the work that you do is hard. And you work with children, no doubt, who come to school with, with a lot of things against them. Right? You come to, you, I showed a video yesterday in my session, and I'm working with a little girl, and I showed her a little die like a, that you would roll in a game. That, and this is a kindergarten age child. And I said, have you ever seen one of these? And she said, no. I've never seen And she never had. So you work with children who come to school with lots of challenges, lots of challenges. What's important for you to know is the instruction that you're able to provide is more powerful than any demographic risk factor that those children bring. I don't think teachers hear that enough. The quality of what unfolds between you and the learner is what makes all the difference. Those are on the left side. Those are huge effect sizes. I, I took these from Hattie 2009, his great visible learning book. Now if you look on the category on the right, these are the things that the school boards love to talk about all the time. Sometimes these are some of those things that come back with a new name in a few years and we are talking about them again. Look at the difference in the effect sizes. So why are we still talking about whether or not we should retain kids? Give them a gift of a year. It's a negative effect on average. We should be doing that with tremendous caution. Um, it, does, it is not demonstrated to improve learning for um, 
most children who experience that. Within class groupings, adding money, spending more money. You can add 10% per pupil spending. It will not necessarily raise achievement. The effect size is 0.23. That's a crappy effect. If you were running a corporation, you would not choose to invest your resources in that tactic because it will not give you the return that you are after. Reducing class sizes. In general, um, I, I've, those, those reductions do not give you the return that you would imagine that they would. Now, I'm not talking about taking them from 30 to 5, okay? But in the range of what might be reasonable, maybe from 30 to 25 or 30 to 22, you don't get a return for that. Okay, so I, I took those effect sizes and fit them onto trends, and this is a trend of second grade learning. These are NCE scores on the SAT-10, and this is what happens for each of these tactics, right? So I always say to teachers, don't do those. Do the ones at the top. Do the ones that give you the strongest effect, right? You know what they are? Formative assessment. Comprehensive treatment for specific learning disabilities, teacher clarity, corrective feedback, worked examples, phonics instruction, setting goals, computer assisted instruction. You know what doesn't give you a return? Homework. Summer break, of course, we don't expect that. Class size, aptitude match treatments, web based learning, teacher subject matter knowledge. Can we stop spending so much money on that and thinking that that's going to be our way to improve learning? I mean, I get, I'm not saying it's not important, but it is certainly not enough. It is certainly not uh, sufficient. It's going to give you a crappy effect. Okay, so what you do makes a difference. Let's, let's choose so carefully. If we simply, I've got a simple solution. If we simply use student learning as our guide, it's the best arbiter ever and use the assessment data that we collect because we collect an awful lot of it but we consume very little of it. If we use that and we tend to that and we pay attention to that, then, and we're willing to make adjustments to what we are doing to get a better result, we, we can accomplish anything. I mean, we can get children um, anywhere that we need them to go. Something that I do think we absolutely have to start thinking about how to do in education, we're not good about this, we are not good about this, is we gotta start thinking about yield. In every other industry in the world, people are thinking about if I spend this resource, it's a zero-sum game. So if I, I need to allocate resources in the smartest way possible, well the way that we do that is we can look at a return on investment. And if you want to increase yield in your system, you only have two choices. You have to increase the effect or lower the cost. Or maybe you could do both. And there are some fantastic tactics that are available to us as teachers, as leaders, that can help us get a higher yield. I'll give you a great example, one that I talked about yesterday and we'll talk about later today is class-wide math intervention. It's super powerful. Let me tell you something about class-wide math intervention. If you give it to seven kids, you save one from failing the high-stakes test of math. Well, what's cool about that is everybody gets it at the same time. So it's a 12-minute investment touching every child in the class at the same time, 12-minute investment daily, and at the end of the year, in a class of 28, you will save four kids from failing the high-stakes test. Why are we not doing that everywhere, in every class, right? Why are we not doing that? I don't know, That's, it's really a, a good question. So we need to consider the costs. Again, back to medicine, medical examples work so well. There are always lots of options available to us. There are high cost options and then there are lower cost options. So we know, here's the probability, these are real data from um, randomized controlled trials. This is the probability of a repeat heart attack if you have been treated with a statin drug, which I bet some people in this room take statin drugs. They are designed to lower your cholesterol. Um, so this is the probability of a repeat heart attack. Now, if you're in placebo, that's the probability of a repeat heart attack. So that looks pretty good, right? I mean, if you looked at that, you're, you would probably say, okay, give me the statin. I'll take the statin, right? Um, well, what about a Mediterranean diet? It's the same effect from randomized controlled trials. It's cheaper. There's no side effects, except you might lose a little weight, right? That would be a good thing. You might feel better. So the point is, we have to start thinking about the dollars that we are spending to improve achievement, the dollars we are spending to assess. We weigh, we overassess, and that is a waste of money if it's not helping us change our behavior and get intervention underway in ways that can, can raise um, achievement. So that's an example of class-wide intervention. Now, here's the other piece. Something that we're not very good at doing that could improve our yield 
is to pay attention to intervention implementation, right? So yesterday, I asked teachers in the room, what do you think the probability is of correct intervention use given the following conditions? You say, yes, I agree to do this intervention. It's, it's philosophically okay with me. I'm willing to do it. Um, somebody comes in and provides you with all the materials that you need to conduct the intervention for a week. And then an expert comes in and shows you how to do it, watches you do the intervention to two consecutive run-throughs with 100% independent and accurate performance, and then we just go away and covertly monitor what's the probability of intervention use. And I made people coral respond yesterday, and I won't do that today, I'll just tell you it's terrible, it's 12%. That's what the research literature says. And the reason that should get your attention is it's probably more support for intervention implementation than you've ever had. Am I right? Okay, so that's a big elephant in the room for us as educators. How can we actually support the interventions that work and stick with them? It goes against human nature. We are just, as humans, we don't like to stick with things. I don't finish antibiotic prescriptions. My husband's a physician. He won't write me one because he knows I won't finish it. As soon as I feel better, I'll stop taking it. Um, people don't follow diets. People don't follow budgets. I mean, this is human nature that we are fighting against, and yet, you know, a lot of the tactics that are so, so, so effective are not new ideas. They've been around forever. They've been around for at least 30 years. I use a lot of those tactics. What we struggle to do is get them into the same room with the child consistently for a sufficient period of time where it can make a difference. So this is an example of something, a way you can track. These are all classes who are participating in class-wide intervention. We simply go to the classes where the rate of progress is lower. And you know what's neat about that as a coach or as an administrator? Those are often not the classes that you would naturally want to go to. And they're often not the teachers that say, hey, come. Come to my class, right? Um, so it tells me I need to go to class 9, 10, and 11 because their rate of progress is slower than the other classes. And I need to go in a friendly way just to say, hey, can I help? What's going on? Do you have everything you need? Can I watch? There's something weird about this group of kids that they're, they're growing a little more slowly. Maybe we need to kick it up a notch and see if we can get some more growth for these students. Okay. The key is everybody should grow. I've never met a child who could not beat their score from the day before. Everybody can grow. Everybody can grow. And if your graphs don't look like this, and if you're not harvesting your data to look at your graphs, this is simple fall and winter screening data for an entire grade. It's a small grade. There's only 50 kids in the grade. But everybody grows. Do you see that? Do you see how that works? And if they didn't, then I need, I need to look at that. I need to pay attention to that because I'm not, I'm not delivering the return on investment that I need to, to return. So I think decision makers should ask, what's already available? What's agreeable to teachers? You know, we, we talk about it intellectually, like we don't want to do an add-on, we need to think about substituting efforts. It's so true. We should be asking, what are people comfortable with? What do we already have in place? How can it be tweaked? What is the lowest cost way, the least complex way to attain the goal that we're after? That's what we should be asking. There's a guy named Atul Gawande. Have you ever heard of him? He's got a great TED Talk. He wrote the um, Checklist Manifesto. Anybody know that? It's a great book. Um, but anyway, you can watch him on the TED Talk YouTube channel. And he's got a great 10-minute talk that would be a dynamite um, faculty meeting lead off and he talks about in medicine how we have basically become so specialized so uber specialized that in effect we have built this car with beautiful state-of-the-art components but it won't drive it won't go anywhere and in a way this is happening in our world this is happening in our world I'm an expert on a case and I uh, mentioned this yesterday and so I'm looking at these data and I'm and I'm seeing wow beautiful specialized components. Really well done. Well intended. People really put the effort in. Read, there's a lot of cost in that, okay? And none of it talked to each other. None of it talked to each other. Great progress monitoring data. Great supplemental support. Great evaluation. None of it spoke to each other. None of those people ever went, got in the same room, as far as I can tell. 
So we are living some of what Atul Gawande talks about in that we have become so highly specialized and we've got all these components that we go to conferences and we hear about. We go back and go, okay, we need to do universal screening. Let's find the best screener. Let's get that underway. But what we fail to do is put that into our context and say, how does this connect to what we're going to do tomorrow? How does this help us evaluate our programs, the reduced risk that we're getting for children over time? That's the piece that we're missing in so many places. Okay, so for all we know, for all we know, and we know a lot, we really do, how is it that we, we are not able to get effective instruction every single day in a stable way into every class for every child? Why, can't, why are we not able to do that? Okay, well, David Tilley says the challenge is really not about knowing what to do. It's getting people to do it. He's a great leader. Anybody ever seen Dave Tilley speak? He's a great speaker. He comes from Iowa. He's been very involved in the, he's a leader in Iowa. I think he's the state superintendent, whatever they <laughs> call that position. But he's a good friend, and he's a co-author on, on one of my books. But um, anyway, he says the challenge is getting people to do it with you. And I agree. And so let me, let me share with you this idea, technical mastery versus artistic expression. I think we are too focused on technical mastery. It's very important. There's no question it's very important. And technical mastery is knowing what to do. It's knowing which universal screening to select. It's knowing how many minutes to time the assessment. It's knowing how to get it into the computer and get the graph. It's knowing sort of like the active ingredients of what needs to get done. It's very important, right? That's technical mastery. Artistic expression is having a rapport with your teammates, having a rapport with the people who follow you as a lead, if you're an instructional leader, to have the comfort level to be able to look at it honestly, have a conversation about it, be vulnerable and identify the soft spots, even if they happen to be in your classroom. To feel supported by your colleagues so you know you could try something different. Artistic expression really matters. You know, in my early days, I would, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you, but if a teacher would have a question about something early, like I'm, gra I'm a grad student at this time, I would say, well, let me tell you why you're wrong. And I thought she was going to receive that pretty well because we had the right answers. We were learning how to do RTI, and we could tell her with data how she's totally wrong. Don't worry about it. You're just wrong. Let me show you the right way, you know? You might imagine that does not go over well. That does not go over well. But that is still what happens, I think, in lots of places with RTI. You can't hammer people into doing the components. It has, you have to, we have to bring some artistic expression into this. So I have some advice for you if you're a teller, if you're somebody who's ever felt like saying, you're wrong, if you've ever been told, you're wrong. Maybe we need to think about how to bring some soft skills back to the work that we do and use some of these ideas. Have an attitude of interest and curiosity about the data. Even if it's your data, which can be very threatening, right? And it, again, it requires that the people around you are open to having that conversation with you. Um, that means you can't use the data to hang somebody, right? Uh, data should always be intended to help, not harm, not hang. So in some places, it's to hang. Data are collected to hang. That's no good. That's a deal breaker for me. Um, avoid leading and rhetorical questions. Draw somebody out. Ask questions to which you do not already know the answer. Sometimes we do have to confront people's misconceptions. Sometimes we have to confront each other. Um, that's true. Good colleagues should be able to do that. But when you have a, a confronting question with somebody, you have to remember you've just burned a lot of rapport. You've just used a lot of credit in the bank, and you have to be very, very careful that what is conveyed to you, what is shared with you, that you don't use it to bring punishment or shame to the person who has shared it, but instead you use it to make things better. And if you do that, then over time, people will be more willing to be more honest about the data and the soft spots in the system. So I love this quote from John Haas, and he, he's known for saying this. Don't bring data to a faith fight. Don't bring data to a faith fight. Well, we have way too many faith fights in education. Like, why are we still debating these sort of dogmatic positions around how things should happen? Could we just have an allegiance to what works? Could we just have an allegiance to looking at what brings us results and say, let's do more of that? I don't care what you call it. I mean, if I could say, learn to stand on your head and 
students will have better outcomes. You know what, I'm going to learn to stand on my head. I don't care what the philosophy around that is. We need more of that. We should not be having faith fights. It's not really about faith fights, and he is right. You do not win them by showing up and saying, it's okay, you just have it wrong. Let me tell you why you're wrong, and then we can move forward. That doesn't work. You can't bring data to a faith fight. So what works really and truly is trust, and I love Edgar Schein's definition of that, that is something we need to cultivate better. We are still, our pieces and parts are not speaking to each other in schools. We need to um, make sure that we have an atmosphere in schools that says, I will be acknowledged, I will not be taken advantage of, I will, no one will embarrass or humiliate me on purpose, um, you can tell me the truth, you won't cheat me, but rather work on my behalf to support the goals we have agreed to. That's, you know, that's a pretty high standard. And you could ask yourself, does that, you, does that happen for you in your setting? Do you feel this? If you don't, it's something that you could work on. Okay. Now, once you've gotten, once you've gotten there, once you've gotten this artistic ex expression, this soft, the soft skills that really do need to come back to school psychology, for example, I can say that um, since I'm a school psychologist, we need to do more of that. Okay, but then you do have to help people figure out how to do the things that will work, right? Because if they spin their wheels, if they're doing things that aren't paying off, they're not going to, they're not going to continue to work on the effort. The effort has to work. And you have to be able to spell it out for them so they know which active ingredients are going to lead to improved outcomes. And you know what? It, here's a secret. It's not sexy stuff. It's not cool, big batteries of assessment and subtest scatter interpretation. It's not. It's, it's pretty simple stuff. What are our instructional time allocations? What is our instructional calendar? Do we know where we're going instructionally? Have we worked that out? Do we have agreement about that? Do the second grade teachers talk to the third grade teachers so they have a system of knowing what children are going to come in with and they know what they need to go to fourth grade with? It's the simple stuff, I'm here to tell you, and that is where we are stubbing our toes. We're just not getting it done. Um, you got to tend to your slow adopters. Some people call these resistors. Anybody listen to podcasts? Here? Okay. There, have, do you know the Revisionist History Malcolm Gladwell podcast? It's so good, right? Okay, he has one where he talks about endowments at universities. And this is what first got me into his podcast because all the universities were so mad about this podcast because he said, do not give your money to places like Stanford. And long story short, the case he was making is that education, um, society in some ways, and sports, which some of you might be interested in, are a weak link, weakest link endeavor. Okay, and what he meant by that is you don't, you don't actually get the outcome that you want if you're working on system-wide math improvement, if you're in, you, in the name of RTI, it doesn't matter if you call it RTI, it's, you know, it's, that's in some ways a new name for old techniques, but whatever you are working on that is a system change process, it's a weakest link endeavor. And what he means by that is your thoroughbreds are just going to do it. They, you show them the way, they run to the top of the hike. That's a picture of a hike I've been on many times outside of Tucson called Mount Ryston. You can show them the peak. It's one of those hikes where you are walking and you think there is no way we could be going there. Can't be, but then later you realize, oh my gosh, we really are because we're almost there. Um, and it is, it's a very, very tough, challenging hike. The thoroughbreds are just going to run. You show them where to go, they're going to go for it, they're going to pave some new ground, they're going to teach you some ideas about how to do it better. That's the easiest part of implementation. You know how the implementation cycle usually works? Somebody like me shows up, says, hey, let's do this great thing. The thoroughbreds are excited to see you, the other people are quiet. The thoroughbreds do great, they make you look fantastic. One year later, I don't show up anymore, and then it stops working. You know why? Because the people who were quiet never did it. The thoroughbreds would have done it anyway. They, guess what? They were consultant proof. Get it? They were consultant proof. They didn't need the consultant to show up. So really, the weakest link has to be tended to, the slow adopters. And for those folks, I find the best way to approach that, and it's costly, is not, you can't just show them the way and have them run. You've got to break it into manageable pieces. Small, like a task analysis, like a great special ed teacher, a task analysis where you say, no, 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 don't worry about it, we're not going up there. We're not, don't even look at that. We're not even talking about that. We're going to see a really cool tree around this corner. Let's just go find that tree. That's all we got to do.
Um, I used that with my son for years. When he was a little guy, he's a teenager now, he'd be embarrassed for me to tell this, but um, I would say, hey Ben, it's time to go take a shower. And he would like lay down on the floor. I can't take a shower, why do I have to take a shower? I took a shower yesterday. And, and I would say, no, 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 don't worry, we're not even talking about that. We're just walking down the hall to your bathroom. We're not talking about taking a bath. We're just going down the hall. Okay, now just take off your shoes, you know? And that's how we did it. Before you know it, he'd be in the shower complaining out, drying off, still complaining, getting dressed. I mean, when he was a little guy. Um, and it was over. So the point is, for slow adopters, for people who really just don't want to do it, break it into manageable chunks, a lot of support to get that implemented. There's going to be a lot of complaining. There's going to be, that's fine. And then when they experience the result of it, didn't totally, my son didn't totally love being clean, so that didn't really work. But I have yet to meet a teacher who's not absolutely rewarded and reinforced and encouraged and inspired about seeing her own or his own students grow. But you gotta, you gotta get them there. They have to do the work to get the taste of that reward to want to do more of it. There's a guy named Aubrey Daniels who talks about traditional accountability, and he, and he is a wonderful writer. He mostly works, though, with Fortune 500 companies. He wrote a great little chapter on education. It was a title like, What Would It Take to Make Schools Great? If you want to read it, email me on that slide, that front slide, and I will send it to you because I have a scanned-in copy of that, and I know he wouldn't mind. But, um, but anyway, he's, it's, his name is Aubrey Daniels, and he says traditional accountability flows like this. What you're looking at right on the slide, you've got the executive, and then you have the middle people, and then you have the frontline people way at the bottom. The frontline people don't ever talk to the executive, they don't ever talk to the manager, they only talk to the supervisor, this is the way it works, okay. Aubrey Daniels says that's totally wrong, that's all wrong. What we should be using is what he calls reverse behavioral engineering. He says what we should do is we should begin at the front line and ask the question, what is needed? Remember I told you, what happens between, the quality of what happens between the teacher and the learner trumps everything. So he says we should start with that. That's where we should start. And every single support structure, every single bureaucratic layer, all the way out, we should be asking how does this either support the quality of what is happening between the teacher and the student or not. And if it's not, then we need to tweak it. We need to make adjustments. So we start with the front line, it's called reverse behavioral engineering, and we support that. And we require, really, we have a standard that says every layer outside of that, every coach, every special ed director, every layer should support, every school psychologist, every educational diagnostician should support or not support what's happening between the teacher and the learner. If they're not supporting, then we have to figure out how to tweak that and make better use of that, that resource. Okay, and then also, what happens a lot in systems is we say this is what we value, we say this is what we are after, but then we behave in ways that are not consistent. So to look at your own organization and, and say, ask yourself, are we inadvertently reinforcing the wrong behaviors? Do, does it line up what we say we want, what we do, and what we reward? Does it line up? I'm going to give you a classic example. We know that years of education and the amount of um, money that we pay teachers does not actually relate to how effective teachers are. There are some really dynamite brand new teachers. And there are some really awful 20 year teachers. So it's not a perfect, it's really not related. And yet all of our reward systems for teachers tend to be how many years have you worked? How many degrees do you have? Right? And what has happened is teachers have said, oh, okay, I need to get that extra degree because then I can go up on the pay scale. So then all these other businesses crop up to provide those degrees, but did it really help you become a better teacher? You know, you can probably relate to that. In some cases, yes, no question. But for the most part, it's a great example of how our reward system in education is out of sync with, with what we say we're after, which is rewarding highly effective teachers, right? Okay. So if we start to do these things, if we start to demonstrate not just technical mastery, but artistic expression, if we build rapport, we, we systematically cultivate trust, we really need to be, have our principals, 
our special ed directors, our uh, curriculum and instruction leaders, our superintendents, functioning like the highly paid leaders that they are. The, the best, you ought to function like the greatest CEOs on the planet doing the most important work because it's so socially meaningful. If we do those things, then we can see that people are willing to share resources because people in your environment will start to see all kids as every adult's responsibility. Um, in places where resources are scarce and the rapport and the culture is not right, is not healthy, what happens when the resources become scarce, and you've probably seen this, is people get very destructive. People get, begin to fight over resources, and, which is crazy because every kid in that school is everybody's responsibility, right? So if the environment is healthy, if the culture is healthy, people do begin to feel that way and embrace that, that all adults are responsible for all learners. And then people are willing to think about what can I change in second grade that might benefit third grade, right? Or what can I give up so that the resource can be spent over here because it's better for, for the greatest number of students. Um, definitely you have to manage your message because when you are engaged in a change process, there are folks who are going to um, question it and have problems with it. So what, what I suggest is that, that you, seek, you seek that out. You know where it is, you go seek it out, you find it, and you say, let's have this conversation. And, 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 and state very explicitly with, with your folks, we are all agreeing to get on board with this change effort. Um, folks who are upset about it and need a place to vent, here's where you can go. You will be listened to, we will respond to what we can respond to but it's got to be contained. It's not acceptable for this to come up in IEP meetings with parents. It's not acceptable for this to come up at faculty meetings as event session. We're, we will have structured time and a structured way for feedback to occur, but this can't, this can't become a toxicity that bleeds, bleeds everywhere. So Bushel and Bear say the first step is to figure out where you are. If you don't know where you are, you are lost. It doesn't matter where you're going, right? You can know where you're going, but if you don't know where you are, you'll never get there. So. This means facing some hard truths for some places, but the great news is everybody can grow. I think everybody in this room ought to know like immediately what is the proficiency rate in reading and math in your school. Everybody should know that. We should all know that. We should know what's the percentage of kids in your district who are diagnosed with a learning disability or who are receiving services on an IEP. These are like basic characteristics of your, your work environment that you should know about. You really should know about that because that's part of, part of what you're trying to um, influence. And there's that great quote from Reynolds 1975. In today's context, the measurement technologies ought to become integral parts of instruction designed to make a difference in the lives of children and not just a prediction about their lives. So now finally, at the end of all of this, you get to use your wonderful skills to help children have better adaptation. That's what we are masterful at doing, right? So we can use our analytical know-how to look at ourselves, look at our environment, and say, do I have the skill and capacity to deliver what children in front of me need? And if not, how can I get it? Do I have the environmental support and the space to do the work that I know I need to do? I mean, sometimes it really is a matter of, I cannot attain the math learning you want me to attain for students with a 40-minute lesson a day. I cannot do it. I need 60. And then that is, that's an ask. That's an ask of your environment that you can begin those conversations. Um, implementation, of course, is the linchpin. So even after we figure it out, getting it done, and sticking with it, you know, I, have a, I do have a theory about that. I think sometimes the reason we shy away from implementation is we hedge our bets. We get nervous. We get anxious. I've worked with, I'm thinking of, I'm picturing a teacher's face that I know who um, is a great teacher. She's not a terribly effective math teacher. She wants to be. She loves to teach math. The problem with this particular teacher is she changes tactics. You, do you know teachers like that? Maybe you're a teacher like that. She will implement something for about six weeks. And then she'll hear about something new and she starts getting nervous. That what if this thing I've chosen to implement doesn't really work? So let me try something else. The problem is I've now known her for about three years. I've never coached her. I've never worked with her. I actually know her as a, as a friend. Um, <laughs> um, fine friend I am, right? Because I'm talking about her, but I didn't say her name. Um, but, but the problem is three years later, 
I'm here to tell you, she's still an ineffective math teacher. And I, and I hate that for her, but part of her problem is she can't commit to implement See It Through because she's so fearful that what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? So, you know, you got to jump off that cliff. You have to actually have, choose thoughtfully, look for something that has some evidence that's been shown to work, and then do it. And go approach it in such a way that it's a little bit bold, right? Like, I'll make it work. Because if you approach it that way, it will work for you. Okay. So let me talk about the science of effective instruction. Because this is something that we are missing. Back in the old days, before we had positive behavior support, I said this yesterday, if you were in my session, you'll know the answer. What, do you know what the most uh, common way to change behavior was? We used to call this louder, longer, meaner. That's how we change student behavior. Um, you know that, that movie, The Christmas Story? You remember the teacher in that movie, which was in, I think was in Indiana, right? Didn't that, wasn't that movie supposed to be set in Indiana in the 1950s or whatever? No, oh, earlier. Anyway, longer, louder, meaner. So we got children to behave by scolding them, by getting loud, by punishing, right? And then we had positive behavior support. In academics, unfortunately, we're doing longer, louder, meaner. We're taking vulnerable kids who didn't learn it the first time, and then we're reteaching the same content at a slower pace during a time that they could be having enrichment that we've now taken away. That is not right. That is longer, louder, meter. That's not good for kids. That's losing the forest for the trees. There is a better way. And if we are much more intentional about the way we define academic instructional intensity, you'll get better results and they can still go to recess. You'll get better results where well, you may not even have recess anymore. Some places have taken that away. And they can still go to PE. They can still have the enrichment opportunity to make the puppet that the other kids are making. This actually matters. This is a big deal. The way we are trying to solve uh, the delivery of academic intensity is not working. It's not working. Here's the better way to do it. If you know where the learner proficiency is in your class, then you can choose your tactic to align with what they need. It's a beautiful systematic effect, and you have that slide which, which shows you how to do it. Definitely there are some effect stealers, and I'm going to target a couple here in my, in my last, last little section. We're almost done. Um, I really want to hit too much screening. This is a big one, and I want to talk about I want to talk about that a little bit. So we are, we are definitely in a place where we are over-assessing. We are in an over-assessment reality in most schools. Now, listen, I'm somebody who's built assessments. I believe in assessment. I've advocated for assessment. And unfortunately, what has happened is people have bought that and said, oh, a little bit of assessment was pretty good. Let's do some more. And now, routinely, I work in schools where, you know, in fact, I have it right here. In a recent study of ours, we found teachers gave five reading measures three times per year, 15 reading screenings to all students in a district, and, and, and happened to be in Minnesota. The other thing is the screening frequency was negatively correlated with student achievement. We had a specific way to look at that. That opens my eyes. You know what? Weighing a cow does not make it fatter. So the assessment will improve learning if it causes you and empowers you to do something different intervention-wise with those kids. If you don't, learning's not going to improve. Weighing a cow doesn't make it fatter. So the first thing we have to think about is, is understanding screening accuracy, which a lot of times people go, oh my gosh, this is like math at this hour in the morning. I can't believe I have to look at this. But I want to demystify this for you. It's not, hang with me right at the end here. Hang with me because it's not rocket science. It's actually pretty simple. It, this is a scatter plot of performance showing on the uh, x-axis the high stakes year-end test score from a state. And then on the y-axis is a curriculum-based measurement reading, so oral reading fluency, okay? And every dot, is, it's a scatter plot, so it's a single child's performance on the high-stakes test plotted against their curriculum-based measured oral reading fluency score, okay? This is our um, past criterion for the high-stakes test. We can't move that. That is what it is, it's set by the state. So children to the left of that will fail have failed the high stakes test and children to the right pass. That's how that works, okay? So we can come in with a screening criterion and that's the horizontal bar. We could move that up and down. 
Now what we are trying to do is we're trying to place that bar, that's the cut score on your screener, we're trying to place that bar in such a way that we maximize the number of cases that fall in the correct negative, so we say these kids are predicted to pass and in fact they do pass the high stakes test, and the correct positive quadrant there, and that is kids that we say we predict they will fail, and in fact they do fail, and we want to minimize our false negative errors. These are kids that we miss. We screen them. We say you're fine. They're going to be okay, and actually they fail the high stakes test. It's the worst kind of error. And then the false positive errors are in that bottom quadrant. It's really that simple. Everything you read from a test publisher that gives you sensitivity, specificity, those kinds of numbers, it all comes from this kind of scatter plot, just like this. And what happens is we like to think, as frontline people, that we're working with tests that work like this. They're perfect, right? They're not perfect. There's tons of error in the assessments that we do. The very best screening measures on our market with a single point in time screening model are usually wrong about half the time. Did you know that? Wrong half the time. If you're on the front line, you probably experienced that firsthand. You probably that's part of why places are sometimes kind of t tentative about acting on a single screening data point, right? And you say, well, what other information do we have? All right, well, it doesn't really work in a, you know, it, it's not perfect. So it usually would look more like this. We have some, we have more false positive errors usually than we do false negative errors. And then here's a little sleight of hand that some screening tools use when they report those numbers to you. They take a little middle band here and they say, these are the definitely at risk kids. These are the some risk, you've seen this before, three categories. And then this is the not at risk, right? Well, you can't have three layers to compute sensitivity and specificity. So let me show you what they do. They remove all of those kids in the middle from the analyses. And then they report to you the accuracy based on kids right there in the top right and kids down at the bottom below the bottom bar. Okay? What happens when you do that is you inflate what the accuracy of the screener looks like. And on the front line, it's not going to feel that way to you because you know why? The reason you screen is you don't know who the in the middle kids are, and that's where all the error is. That's why they get pulled out of the analysis. Does that resonate with you? You follow that? So what happens is when you screen, you probably already knew who those kids were who are circled. You knew who they were. These are your kids who have never failed a high stakes test. They make straight A's. You know, they, they do not miss a lot of school. You know who the ones at the bottom are. Those kids are at risk. The teacher could have told me before I give any kind of measure, okay? The reason we screen is we're trying to figure out among all those dots that are clustered in the middle, those are all kids, who's really, really, really at risk? By the way, that's, these are MAP data. It's MAP screening for the fall and um, Minnesota year-end test on the um, uh, x-axis. Those are the kids, that's why we screen, that's where all the error is. Okay, so the way that the numbers are computed that you see is the correct negatives go here, the correct positives go here, the false positives go there, and the false negatives go there, and what happens is those numbers are the basis for computing sensitivity and specificity, and that is all comes straight from that scatter plot. It all comes straight from that scatter, scatter plot. Um, the takeaway is, if you ever see a screening measure that has three layers of risk, you should be, caught, you should be skeptical of how that's going to function on the front line because you, to get those four cells filled out that I just showed you, you can only have four quadrants. So they're removing something. Something is being removed in order to get there. You can't have three layers of risk. Okay, I'll skip over that. The most critical thing we should be doing as teachers, as teams, as thinking adults who know our children very, very well, we know so much more about them than a single score on a measure, is can we bring some other information to interpret the data? For example, if you go into um, a physician's office and you are a 65-year-old male smoker, you're overweight, and you have chest pain, and your chest pain is 7 out of 10, okay? then your probability of having a heart attack is displayed in red, and your probability of having no heart attack is displayed in blue. If you, these are real, I, those are actually real data that I pulled from some research studies. That if you're a 30-year-old female, non-smoker, normal weight, with chest pain that's 7 out of 10, oh, get, there, there you go. The chest pain is the CBM score. It's the same score. It's the same symptom, okay? 
your probability of really having a heart attack is displayed in blue, and your probability of, uh, I mean in red, and your probability of not having a heart attack is displayed in blue. A good physician will not give the female on the right the same workup that that physician will give to the individual on the left. Why? Because they do not ignore the risk that people bring into the assessment occasion. They do not ignore the risk that people show up with. We ignore the risk. We act like it doesn't matter that a child has moved five times and they got a certain CBM score. We act like it doesn't matter that they're sitting in a school with a 30% proficiency rate and we think we can still pick out the 10 children or the 20% of children that we're going to give individual intervention to. That's crazy, people. That's crazy. We should be looking at the risk that people bring into our assessment occasion and we should operate accordingly. We can do this in a, in a variety of ways. Um, one of the ways to do that is to empower places to choose to go ahead and deliver intervention before we ever conduct a screening. In a very, very high risk setting, that makes a lot of sense. Um, happens in medicine all the time. If it didn't, people would not be healthy. They would be sicker. We would have more deaths. They do it because it makes it, it, it's more effective. The definition of a bad test is a test that you give when you already know the answer. And we do this all of the time. In fact, we've got our highest performing kids in some systems who have never shown up as at risk. And at the end of their sixth grade year, you could calculate how much time did they spend in unnecessary screening assessment. And I guarantee you, you could have done something more useful for that kid. I get worried about that because this is the generation that's going to choose our nursing homes and be in charge of it. And I do worry about what are we really doing? for these children, for these higher performing children? What are they missing out on because of some of these practices? Again, which are well intended, but there's a cost to it. And the definition of a bad test is one that you give when you already know the answer. This happens every year, not always in the same ER, but, but it happened this year in my husband's ER, and he called me and said, oh, it happened. And what I'm talking about is a positive pregnancy test in a male. That happened because you know, a cup of urine, you can't tell that's male or female, got ordered for a test, which it got, which came back positive, but it happened to have come from a male. You think that male's pregnant? No, it's a false positive error. What was the mistake? They gave the test when they already knew the answer. Now that's, a, that's an extreme, but it was one that really happens, which I think is hilarious that that happens. But, but again, it should cause you to say, when you are giving tests to children when you already know the answer, for the most part, you're simply, the only thing the test can do for you is confirm what you already knew, which means it's a waste of time, or give you bad information, or give you bad information. Unfortunately, for us, it's not so clear cut. What happens is, is when a test comes back and, it, and we already knew the answer, but now the test tells us that is wrong, we go, well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we were wrong. Maybe this child really is at risk. And then we are spending more resources to try to figure out how, how to do something that's wasted. It's all wasted effort because we tested when we already knew the answer. So what should we be doing instead? We should be using gated screening. Certainly, at least once a year, you'll want a data point on every child to look for your system, you know, look at your system health. But beyond that, you, it's hard to justify a data point on every single child at every single screening occasion. We should be looking at post-test probabilities and comparing screeners over time. And this is an example. I'll tell you what, just pay attention to the red. And the red farther left means more accurate. And what you will see is from fall to winter to spring, using curriculum, this one happens to be curriculum-based measurement, it becomes more accurate when we are using gated screening. What I mean by gated screening is we screen the first time. Anybody who's not at risk, we take them out of the hopper. And now when we screen at winter, we're only screening the people who showed up as at risk in the fall. Suddenly, we're becoming much more accurate. Look at that, from 12, 12% is bad because tw that's 12% of kids who we've basically we've missed. As time goes by, we get that down to 4% using a gated procedure. And here's another little takeaway. What should we be doing? Integrating intervention with our screening measures to enhance accuracy. So this is a measure that we used uh, with a, there's a high base rate of failure in the setting. If you have a high base rate of failure in the setting, then no measure will perform for you. It just can't. It's, it's like you are giving flu tests in a flu epidemic. You're going to have a lot of error. So if you are using, if you've got a high base rate fail rate in a, in a system, 
the very same screener is not going to function, but if you can lower the base rate by delivering effective system-wide intervention, which we did, these are real data, suddenly the very same screener becomes very, very accurate. Do you see that? Re remember, red to the left is, is very, very, approaching zero is perfection, okay? So with some final thoughts, and I said all of that, this is showing the benefit of a cancer screening by age at reducing the occurrence of cancer and death. And the line is the chances of cancer and death, okay? We should be looking at our screening data to say when we use this academic screening, the probability of failure goes down. And that's, that's a tough order. Uh, we have a data set right now. This, is, this um, paper is under review at School Psychology Review. And the reviewers don't like this graph, <laughs> so we'll probably be adjusting it. But what it shows is that we cannot show a screening benefit for anybody except the children who were most, most, most at risk on the preceding year-end test. Those are the only children for whom we can show this screening benefit. Um, so we should be thinking about what are the consequences of our actions. Is risk going down? Are we using our resources as efficiently and as effectively as we can? We should be looking at system-wide interventions, looking for improved outcomes. You can get that from your screening data. You collect it more efficiently in a more econ economically responsible way, not, not five measures three times per year. It's unnecessary. And make sure that you're having that intended risk reduction over time or increased mastery over time. So the idea for me is let's do what works. How do we get people to do what works? I think about RTI as the scaling of effective instruction. I've always thought about it that way. I don't care what we call it. I'll still be doing it when it falls out of favor and they give it a new name. It's simply the scaling of effective instruction. So for, how, for all we know, how have we managed not to ensure that every single child encounters effective instruction every single day? That's, that's what I will leave you with. Let's do what works. And uh, if I promised a couple of things that you didn't, that you're interested in, like to read or uh, citation, shoot me an email. I'll send it to you if I have it, or I'll send you a link, okay? Um, that is my last slide. Thank you very much. Have a great conference, and thanks for having me. <laughs>